and I saved the best for last to show you this wonderful doll. But first I want to make a little comment about the Jumeau firm. Why did this firm succeed where others faltered along the way, merged into others, or just simply disappeared? I call it the Jumeau-ism. And you can try to remember this about this company and why it made it different. ISM-ism. First of all, industrialization. Jumeau, way before Henry Ford, came across the idea that things could be uniformly designed and put into a production in a way that would, would make it everything under his control and his work. And that is why he did his, fir his large factory in Montreuil where every single product was produced by him. This was totally different than anyone else in France who would order a dress from here, hair from there, body part from here, and have to depend on other people for quality control. Jumeau said, no, I will do it all under my factory with my people that are specially trained by me, and I will have control of all the product. So his industrialization was the first thing that really um, made him important. Secondly, was specialization. He really specialized. He wanted to make a beautiful child doll. And he didn't do a lot of extra things, like Jim Brew at the time was doing all sorts of little different features, different type of bodies, different um, mediums of bodies, different faces, mechanical actions. Not Jim O. Clear on, a beautiful child doll in a fashionable costume. That was it. So it was his specialization. And third, and again, here, he is so far ahead of anyone else of his time. He is like mid-20th century madmen, marketing. This man was a marketing genius. He presented his dolls at all the international expositions. He did booklets. He did promotions. He did, at the fairs, he produced his the Jumeau game of the Jumeau dolls competing against the German dolls. Everything he did was geared toward marketing and making his doll so important that when you said the word Bebe, you thought Jimo. But he was an entrepreneur. And what happens with entrepreneurs when their market gets so big and so demanding, it becomes hard for them to control because this is not what they are. They're about getting things going and the excitement of it and marketing it and talking about it. And somewhere about 1892, he began to get a little bit bored with what he was doing. And so he began to look around for other things he could do. This is when people were really starting to copying him, like the Bebe Louvre and the Bebe Francais that we talked about. But he began to look, what can I do that's more interesting? Well, there were automatons were very big at the time, parlor automatons, pretty little girls and a little square box, and they would be serving tea or they would be knitting or something like that. And one of the major marketers of this was Leopold Lambert, whose wife also, by the way, just like Ernestine Jumeau, made the costumes for their automaton. But Leopold Lambert thought, you know, my automatons would be even better if they had faces that seem to be imitating the action that they're doing. For example, there was one doll that was one automaton he did where a little girl was holding her broken doll. Well, now, rather than have a pretty sweet face, wouldn't it be better if that face was highly characterized and the child was crying? And so he approached Emile Jumeau, and he said, Emile, I have a plan. I need you to design some bisque heads for me that will be highly characterized, very highly characterized. And Jumeau said, OK, I can do that. So he brought in some of his top sculptors, and they came up with a series of heads, very small sizes, size 2, 3, and 4, that were made for Leopold Lambert, for his automatons, and hence we have the girl with a broken polichinelle and other automatons made by Lambert at the time. But then Jumeau started thinking. He said, hey, wait a minute. I've got all of these models anyway. Um, now, when I made them for the automatons, they have that square cut-off neck, but all I have to do is make the standard bebe neck, that light bulb neck, and I can have a new child doll. I can have a character doll. And so he introduced what he called the series fantastique. And the series uh, began number at 200 and went up to 220, except for 213, because everybody was very superstitious at that time, and they didn't make it 213. And they were extremely rare and so hard to find that they rank uh, probably among 
of the top five rarest dolls in the world today, certain numbers of the series. And one of those numbers is our wildly smiling little girl right here with this wonderful, eager, happy, just joyful smile. And it is the model 201. When we did the Jumeau book, when Francois and I did the Jumeau book, we were lucky enough to have the inventory of the Jumeau company in 1899. And in that inventory were listed the dolls from the series Fantastique and how many existed. Now remember, at this time when Jumeau was making his dolls, hundreds of thousands of Jumeau dolls were being made by the 1895. I mean, this was a big, big production. The series Fantastique, at the end of that time, in 1899, of this model, 201, there were only 59 dolls in every size, and in this size 11, there were only eight dolls that existed. Now, I have searched. I've called everybody I know who would have this type of doll or who would be knowledgeable in this type of doll and said, tell me, I want to know because I don't want to say it if it's not true. Do you know of any other existing example today of this model, 201, in any size? And I only found one other, and that was in a book written by Marie, uh, Marie Tarnowska some, I don't know, perhaps a decade ago on rare character dolls, and she showed one, which is not this one. So there are only two examples I know of this doll. It is so extraordinarily rare, and to rival that is its incredible characterization. It is so wonderfully done. I need, you need to look at it. I hope the camera will pick it up from every angle so you can see the angles of the face, the high planes of the cheekbones, dimples not just in the cheeks but down like below the mouth, the little pointed chin, the wide beaming smile. There were three smiling models made in this series, in the 200 series Fantastique, and every one is smiling in a different way, all three of them. Uh, this one is just really remarkable. Uh, very high dramatic blushing on the cheeks, very thick eyeliner with like a gray shadow um, framing the eyes to give them that extra dramatic ping, and then the condition, extraordinary. I mean, this is what you dream to find. You dream to find great rarity, great presence and beauty and artfulness in the painting, and then to have it so perfectly preserved. This is wonderful. It's from a, a private collection of Violet Macamill from uh, the state of Maryland, who has ha had this in, from her estate in her collection for well over 40 years. And in fact, she even has a blue ribbon on her from 1978 a Blue Ribbon Award from 1978. So how long ago? Well, it doesn't seem that long to me, but it does to a lot of people. Um, but that is a really extraordinary doll, and I, we are so pleased and proud to be able to offer this in our sale that we'll be having at the Waldorf, a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. I hope all of you can join us. I'll be doing a seminar at that time, and we do have a few seats still available. A seminar is complimentary, and it's, it's uh, what I know you all want to do. It's a hands-on workshop. So not only do you have to listen to me blather on and on about the dolls, we actually pass them around, and you get to look at them up close and personal, and it's a great day. We limit it to 25 people. If you ever have a chance not to come to that seminar, but to any of the ones we advertise, please sign up for them because you'll make wonderful new friends and you'll have an opportunity to see and handle dolls that only people like myself are really blessed enough to be able to work with every day. Hope you enjoyed this video. Love to work with you more. Thank you.